to avoid all of this stuff. Don't become identified with yeah. any one particular ideology or uh, one particular idea. Focus on truth above all else. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, let, awesome. let it lead you, you know, wherever it will. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Mind Matters. Today, joining me in our studio, I have Ilan and Adam. Hi. Hello. We're going to be kind of continuing our discussion last week, going in a few different directions. Last week, we talked about pretty much like thought control, brainwashing, and how opinions and beliefs and worldviews can be created um, without one's conscious involvement and ideas from other people and institutions can basically be implanted into one's own mind and give that person, that individual, the impression that those are their own thoughts and that they have very good reasons for believing what they believe. And I think we might have even advanced the radical hypothesis that most of people's beliefs that's what they amount to, is little more than things that they've picked up over the years that they haven't really um, consciously created or like assimilated on their own using any kind of reason, but that they have come through socialization and media and teachers, family, just the various roots of learning and socialization that are part and parcel of human existence. So, of course, that makes it difficult for for everyone to kind of realize what is actually theirs once you kind of get once you get the flavor of finding out that you've believed something wholeheartedly that you didn't have any good reason to you can kind of it's kind of a process that that someone has to go through in order to realize that they may not know as much as they think they know or that the things that they believe um, might not be as justified as they previously thought they were but I think that a lot of people can go through their lives without having that experience at all. I think it's pretty demonstrable in the world that that's probably the it's probably the norm for people never to have that experience. Um, or if they were to have it, it would be it wouldn't be of such a strength as to actually make a difference. This is something that I've only really seen talked about in depth in a couple of the Polish psychologists that we like, like uh, Kazimierz Dabrowski and Andrew Lobachevsky. Um, Dabrowski with his po theory of positive disintegration and Lobachevsky with his book on political ponderology, where they describe that. Um, they describe processes like this. And maybe I'll, I'm going to see if I can find one of Lobachevsky's kind of um, hard to understand things about this or, or hard to understand writings on this very thing so he says if however we have proved unable to master the problems which it, which occurred these are like problems in um he's talking specifically in a personal example of him and scientists and like psychologists like him who encountered difficulties in the communist regime like in the 50s and 60s in poland um, various problems in their lives that kind of d took them away from their research pursuits, either because of the oppressive nature of the, you know, the totalitarian government, or um, just various problems, various problems in their lives that might, in their lives that might cause them to, um, you know, leave the field or not be able to pursue their their research. So he says. If, however, we proved unable to master those, those problems, which occurred because our reflexes were too quick to repress and substitute the uncomfortable material from our consciousness or for some, for some similar reason, then our personality undergoes what he calls retroactive egotization. But it is not free of the sensation of failure. The results are devolutionary. The person becomes more difficult to get along with. If we cannot overcome such a disintegrative state because the causative circumstances were overpowering, or because we lacked the information essential for constructive use, our organism reacts with a neurotic condition. So, I mean, that's pretty jargon heavy. Um, actually, I should, I should explain 
what he said about that because our reflexes were too quick to repress and substitute the uncomfortable material from our consciousness. This gets more into um, how I was introducing this and the, the nature of some of the difficulties that he's talking about of, of people going through this process because basically what he's saying is sometimes or often people will be they will be they will encounter truthful information the truth about a situation that is uncomfortable to accept for oneself so maybe you you believed one thing uh, 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 an example probably most people have um, experience of or have seen it in someone close to them is for example having an opinion about um, uh, like a partner um, a marriage partner or a relationship partner of some sort or another you have an idea of who that person is and then are confronted with evidence to the contrary of what your beliefs were and that causes a bit of cognitive dis dissonance because um, you've gone through you might have been with someone for years and years and years Jordan Peterson gives a good example of this in his talks when he's he's talking about the 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 chaos that gets introduced in into into one's life that that kind of disintegrative moment where everything falls apart and the example he often uses is discovering after years of marriage that your partner has been cheating on you right and so all of a sudden your entire life gets turned around everything you thought was true is no longer true and you're you're kind of thrown out into the void into chaos where nothing makes sense anymore because the world made sense previously everything was in its proper place and you understood who that person was and what your relationship was or what your relationships were to each other what you were to each other and all of a sudden all of those habits all of those norms all those things you thought were a certain way you get presented with this information that no they they actually weren't like that and it's not like things just changed when you found out the information. In fact, things have been different for all this time that you thought they were something else. So when, con when confronted with a situation like this, there are a number of different responses that a person can have. So what uh, Lobachevsky is talking about here is um, examples like that, where certain psychological processes going on, go on, um, like um, he calls them like repression or... Um, substitution so in a situation like that some people will deny that that actually happened so they will make excuses for their partner and create a scenario in their mind create a, a story in their mind where that revelation isn't true where there's another explanation for all those things of course this is easier for um, subtle clues and hints right you can you can always make excuses for subtle things um, that's very easy when you're confronted with like the the bald truth of something it's much harder but that's not that doesn't mean it's impossible it's you know it's still possible to totally deny something that you see with your own eyes mm -hmm. and that's where the like substitution comes in so when he says substitution he's talking about um, well literally substituting one thought one idea with another so if you if you're like this is just a cliche in film and tv and in novels where the you know the the cheating husband is staying at staying at work late multiple times a week right and the and the wife is wondering what's going on and he's always got a good excuse um or maybe not a good excuse but he's got an excuse and there what substitution would be would be the the wife actually creating the excuses for him you know or believing he has excuses or making it yeah better making excuses for him oh well this is what he must be doing or he, he must be doing that and let's say that a friend sees him out with another woman and then tells her oh I saw your husband out with another woman if this is her personality if this is if this is the way she deals with information like that then she will say oh well, you must have been mistaken he couldn't have been there he wasn't there no you no, you didn't see him and she might take that to her grave until she sees it herself but then again like I said there are always there's uh, there's probably a smaller number of people who will be willing to go literally to the grave without believing without accepting the truth about something and because there is very rarely a situation where you have complete knowledge about um, any given situation then there's always more room for these processes to go on more room for denial and more room for creative interpretation of what the evidence seems to seems to suggest so this is why or this is one reason why 
um, people stay in bad relationships for so long. You know, that's just one of them because, uh, because of this unwillingness to look at the truth and accept the truth. And then in the second part of that Lobachevsky quote, he, he says, there's something that goes on in the mind. He calls it retroactive egotization. And I really don't know what he means by that. Um, but I can hazard a guess. So it's retroactive. It's like you're, um, so you're going back and retroactively, um, making yourself right about something. So, mm -hmm. oh, so actually, oh, actually I was right. You know, um, even though I've been presented with this alternative information, actually I was right before I, even before I saw that information, I'm basically reaffirming my previous belief about something. But he says that's not without a, uh, like a subtle feeling of failure. Every time you lie to yourself, essentially, this is how I'd paraphrase, the, paraphrase this. Every time you lie to yourself, some part of you knows that you're lying to yourself and you can feel it on some level. Again, Jordan Peterson says for him personally, he feels it in his, like in his solar plexus. There's a feeling that like a sensation that you get whenever you're lying and whenever you're lying to yourself, you know, on some level that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just, and it's very subtle. You know, I catch myself doing that. You know, afterwards you say, Oh, you know, oh, but, but it's very easy to cover over. It's very easy to ignore. And then just to go back to normal life and just, just smooth over that rough patch where you weren't quite sure what was going on just to keep things stable and keep things good. And that, I would argue is one of the primary means by which we keep our own like brainwashing intact in ourselves mm -hmm. is that we are, we are our own active censors and propagandists for ourselves. We're the ones constantly, you know, reinforcing, <laughs> reinforcing perpetuating. Yeah, our own propaganda. We've yeah. got this inner propagandist in us and mind controller that is keeping us in that safe zone because we don't like we don't like those chaotic moments no one no one likes to have their whole whole world turned upside down through some revelation that just you know throws everything to pieces it's uncomfortable because then you have to figure out you have to recreate yourself you have to recreate your entire narrative about who you are and what life you're li what life you are living what your place in it is what you're doing and that takes a lot of energy and so we generally don't like doing it and do everything possible to avoid it, even if that means believing lies. I was thinking about it in terms of um, like the color perception show mm -hmm. where she was talking about how your brain has the uh, Photoshop editor that yeah. just, you know, photoshops in all of these different things in, in your vision automatically that you don't even see or recognize. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different because that's completely unconscious. Whereas this, you have that subtle awareness that there is a lie being perpetuated, mm -hmm. um, but it's still like close enough uh, for there to be, you know, the analogy made. And so it's not only the struggle of coming up against uh, your own personal uh, biases, but there's also the uncomfortable truths that would then accompany uh, sharing it with others. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then not only are you like trying to sort out your own things and your own thoughts, but now it's like, okay, well, how do I deal with this in the context of like all of my different relationships? It's yeah. like, you know, if you find out that your, you know, wife or husband has been cheating on you and you've been like paper overing it for, for so long, well now, you know, you had, especially if somebody has been warning you about it the yeah, whole time, yeah. yeah, like, Oh, <laughs> that's painful to have to go to him and finally admit to him. Like you were right. I, I was, was wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, yeah. So uh, it's super uncomfortable. So it's no wonder that it's the default for most people uh -huh. to just completely ignore right. it or not go through that process. Well, the, the feeling that in it, that being wrong uh, about something engenders is like feeling untethered, uh, vulnerable. Uh, if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, then what else am I incorrect about? And uh, like you said, Adam, this is um, this can be a, a very painful thing, uh, especially if your worldviews, I mean, interpersonal relationships, especially that uh, of of a that you have with a partner or a spouse or a girlfriend or boyfriend. I mean that that's probably the most common, commonly uh, dealt with and experienced of of challenges especially when that person doesn't meet expectations or 
like in the example that you were giving Harrison, they're so far away from the ex expectation or, or all the projections or this kind of image that you had created in your mind of that person that it's almost uh, an earth shattering uh, experience. Mm -hmm. I was going to do a little uh, dramatic um, <laughs> kind of uh, e example of this, <laughs> a one act, which is, which is basically, you know, you know this but <laughs> but for but but for maybe dozens and dozens of of uh, torturous hours of uh grappling with certain truths um and just to reframe some of this uh because like you said at the top of the show um we were looking at uh the way that we allow ourselves to be brainwashed and propagandized and to come to believe certain things so uh the the idea here is that this same process applies to worldviews it applies to the beliefs that we hold uh and the feelings that we have about certain uh societal uh issues and political policies and leaders that we have or don't have any faith or trust in and <clears throat> these same kind of structures uh, that we build up in our minds, uh, these emotional, um, that are invested with emotion, that are invested with, with bits of data that may or may not be true, uh, get built up and built up and fortified and reinforced and almost made into this kind of um impenetrable fortress in, yes i was, I was going to say homunculus <laughs> <laughs> to suggest something more uh, biological but uh, yeah the, a, a kind of a block a fortress in in one's thinking uh that that would require um something like a, a disintegration along the lines of dubrowski's work that is is by necessity quite painful and um and i think that being aware of ourselves as that process is available to us of of experiencing um uh difficulties um and kind of reevaluations and uh, you know, going over the data a hundred times in as many different ways as, as our minds will allow us to, to the point of exhaustion, up and down, left, right, you know, uh, esoteric, mesoteric, uh, you know, inside, inside and outside. And, and, you know, if anyone's ever been confronted with something that, that they absolutely believed to be the truth of a situation and and was confronted with compelling information to the contrary it's a process it's a real process it takes time it takes some amount of um for lack of a better word i think therapy with oneself or or with another or writing or uh just talking it out um because uh, these things can be quite profoundly uh, affecting to how we operate. It can it can lay us low, um, and uh, but it's also an important process. It also mm -hmm. helps build us up from a foundation that's closer to uh, the truth of the matter, whatever it may be. Well, I want to get into some some hard examples, like some real life examples. Um, and I think we'll be delving into the two issues that you avoid at Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, religion and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with religion, because when you, were, when you two were talking, I was uh, something came to mind. And that <laughs> feeling that we were talking about, that feeling of knowing that you're lying to yourself on some level, um, it, it made me think of, well, some individuals I've known over the years um, in, a, in a religious climate, like in a in a mainstream um, religious environment. And I'll just state my hypothesis first and then go into it a bit, in a bit more detail. 
I think that the, that feeling of of that that awareness of believing a lie or of lying to yourself. I think that a lot of um, really um, what's the word? It's really what's the word for a really religious person? Like a devout. really for devout and fervently like religious person, they mistake that feeling for sin. Because there are doubts, natural doubts that come to mind because of things that are very doubtful, you know, things that are justified in, in bringing up doubt. And then there is that, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. That makes me question. But then if I question, uh, that, that will open up this chaos for me. I, that might mean that I have to reject um, my religious upbringing, my family, my community everyone and so the so all of those pressures that we're talking about get compounded so that and that feeling is then the thing that has to be stamped out mm. because that's the thing that's causing problems um causing emotional turbulence in oneself is that are are those doubts it's the it's the things that that make you wonder oh well how can that be true um maybe it's just reading the bible for instance or the you know the um any religious book and you you find an inconsistency or a contradiction and this is kind of like the, I think it's one of the first steps of, of um, you know, people who lose their faith and, and become atheists is they see these contradictions and they might just niggle at their mind for a while and then then they might, you know, go off and start reading Rich, Richard Dawkins or something and, and uh, or Sam Harris and be like, <laughs> and uh, have a conversion experience to the new religion of um, atheism. But that's, uh, th- that's kind of what I see going on is that there's this... Um, there's this implicit, well, experiential knowledge of this state being uncomfortable. There's the the social pressure of the the family and the and the community and the the you know the people that you live with and interact with every day, and all of those go to to stamp out that feeling of doubt and that that um, which might be that feeling of doubt which might be the impetus for a like uh, a journey of actually questioning things and either either you know leaving the faith or reinvigorating it in some way and an example like uh, an ex- uh, what am i trying to say an example of that i think <clears throat> i came across this recently because like for years i've i've uh, read books by by christians and by atheists and by um um, yeah, Christians and atheists, and for the most part, Christians and books written by Christians um, kind of, to varying degrees, will accept different, um, a different number of, let's say, like core precepts, or um, maybe you can call them like primary, secondary, tertiary. Like they'll they'll all accept pretty much all the core ones, and then, but then around around the edges of the circle, things get a bit hazy, and they may accept one thing or not, like some Bible scholars will accept that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't the actual authors of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They'll accept maybe that the Gospels were in a generation or two or three, depending on the Gospel, after the the, the crucifixion. Um, but then you'll get maybe the, the hardcore believers that um, kind of, they still believe what the, the, the Christian consensus was hundreds of years ago, um, before you know, a lot of the scholarly techniques have been developed, and and even um, very devout Christians have um, kind of accepted the results of a lot of this scholarship. So you'll get varying degrees, but a lot of still a lot of agreement. And then um, in the atheist camp, again, you get um, you get you still get a variety, but there they are again. Um, there's a consensus among them of what they will reject. They will re- reject all of those core principles, and then um, differ on. Their disagreements in other areas. So the specific example of this is um, the the field or the hypothesis of um, Jesus mythicism, as it's called, um, as opposed as opposed to Jesus historicity. So the debate in the field is basically: was Jesus a real man that actually lived on Earth and did things, and whatever happened? Um, led to the the creation of stories that we find in the gospels and the you know the devotion of um letter writers like paul and then the mythicists will argue that there is no evidence for the actual historicity of jesus in fact the earliest christians 
um, believed in Jesus, but believed in him as a, basically an archangel, like a supernatural being. And that the, the, the stories that, that were generated were basically allegorical and mythical stories about this heavenly figure that were then kind of brought down to earth. So we have these, these two um, conflicting views of reality and the, uh, or views of, you know, the origin of Christianity and the development of Christianity. And um, they're kind of interesting in the ways that they, in the ways that they differ, because like the scholarly approach, and this is in kind of mainstream Christian scholarship, is that there was a man named Jesus and he probably, or, or, he, or he did, he was crucified. But that's pretty much all we can say for sure about him. He, he mustn't have been very popular because he wasn't mentioned by any contemporary historians. And, um, and that over time, the, the story expanded and to the point where you get to the, to the Gospels where there's a lot of legendary and, um, um, legendary and, and fictional like, stuff that got developed over time. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, that's w when you look at um, reputable like, mainstream Christian scholars, that's what they'll say. So uh, uh, an ordinary man, not very popular, who then becomes very popular and more stories get written and his, and his reputation expands as time goes on. And then the mythicists who say that there was a, a, a supernatural being or the belief that there was a supernatural being who then over time became more human. So on the one hand you have, there's a, a simple human, well, simple or not, I mean, because still these, these scholars, if they're Christians, might still argue that this simple, unpopular human was still the son of God, you know, incarnate, was God incarnate. Um, but, that the, but that the stories grew. And then you have uh, a supernatural being who became more human and uh, more mundane earthly details about him developed over time because um, in the same way they would argue that any, if you look at any Greek myth, for instance, when, when they're you know, like Hercules or, or Roman myths or Romulus, you have um, a mythical creature who is, or being, who is put on earth and, um, and then is interacting in an earthly environment with people and has a, a body of flesh and blood and is doing things, but they're stories, they're, they're myths. And everyone nowadays regards those as myths and doesn't, you know, you won't find people today arguing that Hercules did these things in this manner that, in which you find them in the, in the Greek myths or, or Romulus in the Roman myths, etc. So there's, there's that. That's pretty much the setup for, for what I'm going to, for what I'm going to say now, because you have the same debate to a lesser degree. It's not as popular, I guess you could call it nowadays, as Jesus' mythicism. Even though Jesus' mythicism is a tiny field, you know, there's um, re relative to um, um, a tiny field in the kind of in the sea of Bible scholarship. An even tinier field is the um, the same hypothesis about Muhammad, for instance, that Muhammad didn't actually exist as we think of him, and as he comes, as he has come down in um, in the the writings of Islam and in like the the hadiths and things like that. So, but there are a few people who have argued this over the past couple hundred years, just as there are people who have argued this about Jesus. So, I was watching some videos on YouTube of some of the um, some of the people arguing that Muhammad didn't exist as a historical figure, that all, all we know about him was basically legends that accreted over time, over the cent like in the 100, 200 centuries after Muhammad was supposed to have died, and that um, maybe there was a, a figure around whom, or that was formed the basis of this, um, you know, this figure, but they can't say for sure because the, you know, the documentary evidence just isn't there to be able to say for sure one way or the other, which is that's the same state of the evidence for, um, for, for Jesus. If you're looking at it from a historical perspective of the actual like texts on the ground. Um, but that's kind of beside the point. But so I was watching some videos of some of these guys and they're giving really, you know, decent arguments. Like, well, um, I'd say they're using a good methodology, using good arguments, like looking at the evidence and, um, being very skeptical um, like any historian is, um, and have, like some of these guys have probably hundreds of hours of videos on this stuff or books. Um, like one of the guys, uh, 
what's his name? Um, Robert Spencer um, wrote a book, I think, Did, Did Muhammad Exist? He's one of them. There's a, a few others. And uh, so I was listening to a podcast, an interview with a couple of them. And so they were talking about this. And they're both devout Christians. And so um, it kind of struck me, that, well, that's funny. They're using the exact same arguments that the Jesus mythicists use. And oftentimes the, the arguments line up like <clears throat> pretty exactly. The types of arguments they use, even the, um, well, the types of arguments and then the ways in which those arguments are actually um, put together, you could swap out Jesus and Muhammad and the time periods and the authors, etc., and come to the same results. But, um, but you won't find. Are, are you saying that uh, that the Spencer fellow and his uh, compadres would would take the uh, historical reality of Jesus for granted, oh, yeah. but question right, the, exactly. the Muhammad? Okay. So there's this tendency that you see in religion and in politics, where, um, well, this is an example of one of those. Um, Basically, I'd call it a, a belief or a worldview that is formed without, um, without the hard work of going through all the details and going through all the evidence and, and forming it for oneself. Yeah. I still think it is possible to, to form, let's say, a, a, pretty, a, a fairly traditional Islamic or Christian worldview and belief system what, after having gone through this process, but it it'll have some significant differences from the one that that you acquire just without questioning. Um, it requires some kind of um, humility about the the strength of just the strength of evidence, um, because of course you can say, well, you can admit there's no there's there's no really good evidence for for a that would convince every person, right? I I still believe it i think i think that it's probably true i just can't prove it i mean that's perfectly you know people do that all the time i think um you know i'm not gonna rag on anyone for doing that i think we all do it but it takes a lot to even get to that point to be able to say that because um for the the jesus historicist um muhammad mythicists they're they're um they're convinced that Oh look! This proves that Islam is a bad religion. You guys should come around to Christianity because we have the true Son of God, mm-hmm. and you guys are—you guys have just this this guy that was created out of thin air. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you could you, you could probably well um, hypothetically you could have a hardcore Muslim who looks at the Jesus mythicism stuff and says, "You guys, you know, hold on a sec. You know, you're you here you are worshiping this guy that there's no evidence that actually existed. We've got the real prophet, you know, the true prophet uh, that uh, that gave us gave us the the goods." Yeah. Right? And anyone on the outside looking in that doesn't have like a a stake in in either side, you know, it's just it's one of those moments where you go, "Hmm. You know, I can't really take either of you seriously." Um, which is, I think, one of these examples. It's, it's kind of probably the biggest example of religion. I mean, religion's this huge topic. You've got um, those are two of the Christianity and Islam are two of the biggest religions on the planet. And I guess you kind of you have to be an outsider or a person who has come out from the inside um, to 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 see it from the outside. Um, like it's like the friend in the re- in the relationship example, the friend that sees what's going on and, and is trying to warn the person on the inside. Well, you're not seeing this. You're not questioning too deeply about this, and uh, they, the, like the outside person can see the situation with a bit more clarity because they don't have the all of the emotional identification right. and, and emotional investment in a, mm-hmm. in a given pressures. belief and pressures. Yeah, mm-hmm. but if the person if that if that one partner had listened to their friend early on, they could have actually avoided all of the fallout that had happened maybe like years later. Maybe they could have confronted their, their partner and they could have dealt with the issue and, and actually created a better relationship as opposed to drifting even further apart by ignoring it and shoving things under the rug. Mm-hmm. Who knows? It's, uh, and I think it's probably, it, it could be the same thing with, um, with uh, religion where 
Um, like I do, th I think it's very rare, but I do think it's possible to actually have a, a, a reinvigorated faith again to a certain, like, I'm not going to go into detail about what that might look like, but I think it's possible to have something like that with, with the, um, the kind of critical thinking and skepticism that, that might come from questioning all kinds of things within one's religion. It might just be, okay, well, actually I can't. 100% believe A, B, C, D, and E, and e and F. I can, but I can see how how those would fit in. I can, I can, I can come up with a scenario about how those how those came in and why people have believed them, and why it might even there might be actually something good in there that that would um, you know contribute to a you know an ethical worldview or something, or it might even say something um, metaphorical or even maybe literal about the nature of the world apart from our you know just gross physical um physical existence existence like there might be some philosophical like you know cosmological and metaphysical things that can be gleaned but there might but there might be just some things like like okay um jesus did this in this gospel and that in in this other gospel either he did either one or neither of them well does it does it really matter and this is the <laughs> this is the funny thing is that all of the Jesus mythicists are, as far as I can tell, are atheists. At least the vast majority. I, I haven't encountered one who isn't an atheist. But according to their argument, the earliest Christians were mythicists. So ba they're basically arguing that the earliest Christianity was um, didn't believe uh, w it was this full fledged Christianity that didn't believe that. Jesus was actually a human who was born in Palestine and lived 33 years and did whatever. L let me interrupt you, Harrison, because you, you've said quite a lot there. There's a, a um, and there's so many applications to what you just said, but th the one takeaway that I'm getting and something I was thinking about before the show uh, was that in addition to this kind of painful process of, of breaking down and and reconstituting one's thoughts and beliefs about a given issue or worldview or person, uh, there's also the spirit of inquiry mm -hmm. that that can and should be applied in any and all situations as much as possible. And though we'd like to give certain things the benefit of the doubt, certain belief systems, certain people, certain uh, things we think about ourselves, um, it's this spirit of inquiry, this, uh, this curiosity, a natural kind of almost playful but real interest and curiosity in what the truth of the matter may really be, I think, that does have the, the best potential in, as you were saying, reinvigorating uh, uh, an understanding on a particular issue. Um, Not necessarily just uh, like reinvigorating uh, like one's faith in, mm. in your terms, but also um, giving you some stability in order to continue on with the process such that you actually can arrive at the truth. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my experience going through it, being raised uh, in a very uh, strict fundamentalist family. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I was, you know, pretty young, questioning things, being like, well, this doesn't make any sense and that doesn't make any sense and there's no way this can be true. Um, because I, I didn't realize it at the time, but when I was really young, I was a naturalist and not a supernaturalist, which mm -hmm. is kind of conflicting with, mm -hmm. you know, a supernatural religion. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very difficult to, uh, to, to, to handle those kind of conflicting ideas um, and to have the, uh, I guess, personal fortitude or personality like strength strength of will mm -hmm. or character to to be able to push through those questions uh to arrive at the truth and that was that was what kept me going was that i as i started to question things and i started to think more about things it was it was just the drive like i don't care what's true so long as it's true mm -hmm. that's what i want and that's it mm -hmm. and that's yeah. how i persevered and so i think that can be the bedrock on which some some better personal structures yeah. can can be built. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the the two conversations that uh, you don't want to have at holiday gatherings, uh, the first we mentioned religion, and the second, of course, is politics. And um, something that uh, it's very interesting because 
uh, I was reflecting back on the um, George W. Bush administration in the in the 2000s with the 9/11 and the Iraq War and all the hanging of the, chads, the, the hanging chads, and all of the all of the various ways that he was gutting, you know, the kind of security net and social um, uh, kind of systems that were helping to support a lot of people. And there was this big kind of um, strain of uh, conservative and, and fundy thinking, I think, that was um, very active in the military and and among politicians and among, you know, the, the administration's support for certain policies in the Middle East. And so this was really, for a good many years, uh, the you know, the, the kind of thing to react to or, or respond to or, or feel put off by. And uh, there was one study that came out which suggested that conservatives feel physical pain when they, when they come to some piece of information that it contradicts their belief system. Mm -hmm. And so for, for quite a while, this was like, this was like a struck, this was like a, a belief thought structure about a particular uh, part of the political spectrum and how it manifested and existed in the U S and all the, all the kind of undesirable and negative things I had thought about it. And lo and behold, <laughs> <laughs> come, come, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years later, boy found Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're now thrust into a whole other spectrum of, of, political ideology that's got its own set of uh crazy mm -hmm. or or at least unhealthy um thought structures and beliefs and quirks that uh that are just you know uh, again a dramatic uh representation of this hold on adam D dramatic representation of this <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, you know this is something as someone who's who grew up in New York and, and considered myself, you know, liberal or progressive minded and, and open to, you know, good things for everybody and and uh, various beliefs about certain social issues, uh, it it has been something else. But I I'll say that the one thing that is remarkable to me uh, is the level of hypocrisy and, and lack of insight among the today's more vociferous left leaning people who are so blinded to and unwilling to recognize how they're projecting all of the most negative qualities of themselves onto others. And it's, it's a, uh, it, it's so, I mean, the, Maybe because it's now and it's so in your face and, and covers so much of the news and threatens to burn everything down in so many places that it's all the more urgent or apparent to me why, you know, the, the hypocrisy on the left is, is even perhaps even worse in some ways than those things that we were seeing in the 80s among conservatives. Um, but uh, it the the kind of whatever it is whatever in, entrenched uh beliefs and i do believe it has something to do with the um, in emotional investment that has been hammered into individuals from the outside and and from within kind of blowing all of their most you know possibly good beliefs and intentions out of all proportion uh that that makes this such a disturbing um development in in the west and in particular in the u.s there was kind of two things there uh that i wanted to mention number one i'm, I'm curious to know who uh it was that did those uh did that study on conservatives because i would ventured to guess that they were left-leaning people yeah. <laughs> which is curious right uh because then you get into the 
uh, the very problem that you were talking about before with the Jesus mythicists and mm -hmm. the, you know, Muhammad mythicists. And it's like, they'll use it in one way, but not realize that it applies to themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact same way with the people talking about conservatives at that time. Um, just completely glossing over the fact that this isn't a specifically uh, conservative problem. This yeah. isn't a conservative thing. This is a people thing. Yeah. This is everyone. This is you. And it's just funny to me that, you know, they'll, they'll do that um, to bash somebody else, but not realize that it applies to themselves. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was uh, regarding the vociferous nature of the, the liberal minded people who are still, you know, bashing that conservative drum. Um, and I'm wondering if it's, it's because of that. Like it's because they had the eight years of Bush mm. and all of the, mm -hmm. the negative uh, aspects of conservatives at the time, which I, I wouldn't really call them conservatives. They were neocons. Mm -hmm. uh, slight difference there, but. No, it's a, it's a good difference. Good yeah. distinction. Um, really so, liberals. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, um, yeah, just the, they had eight years of Bush and all of that, that they could then use to, to say that, you know, this, this applies to them. And it basically like reinforced the ability for them to gloss over their own wrongs by being able to point to, and rightfully so, uh, point to those groups and say how bad they were because they did do terrible things. Mm -hmm. And so they can use that to then support and bolster their own positions, which is the exact positions that they're pointing at and saying is wrong. Mm -hmm. But the, it's even weirder than that because if we look at the, today's political climate, the, the people who are most vehemently anti-Trump will totally get behind anyone from the Bush administration yes. that comes forward on their side. Whether it's George Bush himself or any of his neocon advisors. Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney. Like, Come uh, on. All of, all of the neocons that were behind, you know, pulling the strings behind the Bush administration – They'll get them on CNN, MSNBC, just to say some, just to say anything bad about Trump. So the worst possible people from recent American history will be welcomed with open arms in the in the cause of uh, you know taking down Trump. And one of the you mentioned an in, uh, an important dynamic, Adam, about the it it really just comes down to hypocrisy. It's being willing to be critical of another group, but unwilling to see that same thing in oneself and one's own group. Um, it's almost like, well, it's this weird kind of mental magic that goes on where it's like you just wave that magic wand and all of the bad things about people are in the out group and not in the in group. I mean, it's just, it's, it's pretty much a, it's pretty much a cliche. It's, that's what humans are like. Uh, you know, all of the, the, all of the bad stuff is that enemy group those outsiders and we're the the holy good um chosen people you know and nothing nothing bad can apply to us that's pretty much what's going on so but it's it's fun to watch it's it can be quite enjoyable or funny um entertaining i, I should say if again if one's on the outside of it um because you can't see it when you're on the inside of it because like if even if we in, the, in american politics let's take the democrat republican divide yeah um there's a lot of stuff wrong with Republicans and conservatives, just like there's a lot of stuff wrong with liberals and, and Democrats. Right. Um, it's just that it's, it's a bit different today where, because today pretty much the entire media and social media complex is liberal progressive Democrat. That's, that is the, the primary messenger. If we go back to the, to the mindscape um, you know, concept of that we talked about last week of these the behavioral um, what do they call it behavioral be, be, well mind program essentially is that the the messenger is important when you control the messenger and that's basically what uh, you you control the the not only the mind space but the airspace you control the mind space through the airspace through the the info space and therefore what an outside observer is going to see is that message. So it's going to be very, it's going to be much more easy. It's going to be much easier to see the hypocrisy and the lies of that, of those, you know, uh, string pullers, those puppet masters, because they're the ones pretty much running the show. 
um, it's because it's very visible. So I'd, I'd argue that in recent years, in the in the in the last four years of the Trump administration, um, that the the people on the right, um, the conservative element, or even or the center even, um, are totally justified in pointing out all of these like evil liberal lies and liberal controlled media because it it's completely true. It's just that all maybe all of the like all the Republican stuff just kind of cut put on the back burner. It, it it isn't making it actually isn't making as much of an impact, despite what the the liberals think, because really the liberals are in control in very important ways of the mind space, mm-hmm. um, and of course that would be um, a that's a heretical thing to say of, uh, among or with from with from within or even from the outside it's a heretical thing to say about the progressive establishment um because it is wrong think you know it just it's not you're not allowed to think that sort of thing or say that sort of thing about the liberals about the progressives like you'll get absolutely chewed up and you know chewed chewed up and spit out on twitter or anywhere for um for going up against this giant machine of the of essentially this new religion of it's not just you know liberals or or like democrats it is i'd say if you if you zoom in on it it is what um what pluck rose and Lindsay in cynical theories call like social justice with a capital s capital j it is this essentially this new religion that's where things are coming from and then you have the if you have this new woke religion then you've got all of the the people like that are tied to it who may not be true believers in such a way, but they, but they're maybe they're on the edges. And that would be, I think a lot of the people in the media, because I I think a lot of people actually in the establishment, the actual intelligentsia and the actual um, like new aristocracy, the, the, or the, the woke bishops and and cardinals and all that they're, they're not true believers. They're like most people, most media personalities are just empty shells. They don't actually really believe what they're saying, or if they do, it's like a surface level thing. They've got this, they live in another world, really. And there are several worlds that exist on the planet. And that's just one of them. Um, like the people on the streets in the, in the protests, like those are the true believers. Um, the media are just kind of, I, I don't even know the, the best way to characterize the media, but they're not, you know, they're, they, they wouldn't get along with the, the people, the, the protesters on the streets. They might go for a photo op, but they wouldn't actually interact they're, they're too like highfalutin for that. They're they're like an aristocracy. They they're um, they're total shills. Total shills and totally totally full of themselves and uh, totally fake. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, I think, still you even in that camp, you you will have some true believers who maybe there's different kinds of true believers. Um, it's hard to categorize all these things. But you have a guy like um, who's the totally crazy um, news anchor guy, Keith Olbermann, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's his name. Like, um, again, going back to the, these weird, how, how the world she, seems to have shifted, but really it's probably just our perception of it that it has shifted where Keith Olbermann during the Bush years seemed to be saying some decent stuff. Right. right? And now he's just, he, he seems to have turned into a total madman who can't think straight. Um, watching, I've only, I've, I've only seen a few clips of him in recent months and years and and he he's unhinged he just seems totally unhinged and I think uh we have Trump to thank for that probably the the the, wor- the worst thing tr- the, the worst thing that Trump has done in my opinion has been to to totally turn uh, an entire segment of the population into like blabbering idiots and um I don't know maybe he should pay for that um is you know the the damage of the of the, the damage that he's done to the mental health of um, a large segment of the population, but that is, well, maybe I'll go back to the the point I started out with about this hypocrisy and pointing out not being able, not being willing to see the things that you'll criticize in others in oneself. And you, you see example of example after example of this over the last four years, the, and of course the most relevant one today is um, potential election fraud or voting voting fraud. There's an important distinction there um, between voting fraud and election fraud because the two are not necessarily the same thing. We can maybe get into that or not. But for years, liberals have been saying that the elections were a fraud and were interfered with by Russians. And now all of a sudden the elections, there's nothing wrong with the elections. There's nothing that can even potentially be wrong with the elections. 
because Biden won. And and how dare you question the integrity yes. of our special election of, mm-hmm. of the U.S. It, it's sacro, it's sacrosanct. Yes. There's never been any kind of interference or election fraud or anything funny or weird ever with our elections. Even though four years ago we and and for the four years since then we've been saying nothing but you know the fact that there was election meddling. It just makes no sense. But there was also. Um, one question that I was wondering about was where the, because it seems like emotions are what are kind of underpinning everything in, in terms of like going unhinged. You know, it's it's like they have, what what's driving it is this underlying identification with something in particular. Mm-hmm. They've become emotionally invested in it. Mm-hmm. And it's because they're emotionally invested in this particular idea, whether it's true or not, um, they have to have it. It has to exist. It must exist because I believe it and it's good and wonderful and great. Mm-hmm. And because of that, when all of the outside evidence is starting to point, to, point towards something else, well, then mm-hmm. their mind has to come up with all these different kinds of ways in order to continue justifying it, which is, you know, uh, taking, I don't even know how to describe it other than just kind of like you're taking a machine that's supposed to do A and trying to get it to do B, and it's falling apart Mm -hmm. because it's not supposed to be doing that. And so uh, the mind is supposed to be um, identified with truth and built upon truth. And because people aren't doing that, that's not where their basis is. That's not where their fundamental core is. Um, They, you know, have all of these different superstructures that are wrong. And so when they come up against, uh, you know, they might have been saying good things about, uh, how bad the neocons were back, you know, eight, ten years ago, or wh- however long ago it was. Um, but now they're just totally unhinged. Like, like Keith, he's just totally unhinged because he had a certain belief structure which worked in a certain number of circun- circumstances. And then when the facts changed, he didn't change with it. Right. Yeah. And so there yeah. went his brain. Well, and and this gets back a little bit to. Uh, the, the subject of last week's show, which was, you know, how social programming exists. And uh, without getting into too much detail here, uh, we've been reading for months how the Democratic Party and it, all its uh, apparatchiks and the, you know, have gotten the help of, of various organizations to basically war game this election. And that is to... Uh, to fix the vote enough that when Trump would naturally and expectedly question fraud in various key places, key battleground states, that the narrative would fall right into place about Trump not willing to give up his his office or not being gracious and conceding defeat in the way that Hillary did, (laughs) As, as if such a thing... You know, is she's is still a, talking about that, by the way? Yes, <laughs> and and was part and parcel for creating what has been known as the Russia Gate uh, collusion narrative, which which put this country in, you know, set this country back for four years. Uh, so you know, these are these are these are things. So we're talking about a couple of different things here. We're talking about a most Machiavellian. Uh, design of social programming, political social programming, that is pretty much documented. You know, you can you can dismiss it as a conspiracy theory, but all of the people, all of the the you know color revolutionary experts in the in the you know State Department and and the various voter technology experts and the you know people in the democratic party who who were used to pulling the levers of power have been talking for months with one another have been sitting around in the boardroom and thinking about how to get trump out of office and this is what they came up with and these machiavellian you know nincompoops they managed to they managed to really pull off a very big con and and uh, deception among a lot of Americans. And that's, what's very sad about this whole thing. And it's not just that 
uh, they war gamed it out. Like that's totally expected. Um, it's the fact that they told us about it beforehand. They told us that, like Biden, he said that if the media says that I won, <laughs> I'm going to act like I won. Mm. And that's exactly what we're seeing. The, the media, which in previous elections, even when it was contested, never declared a president. And yet now they have. And Biden is saying, well, I'm the president-elect. And you just, like, you can't, like, they're telling you what they're doing before they do it. And it reminds me of something that you shared the other day, or yesterday, Harrison, about um, the, uh, the postal worker who yeah. got interviewed by, who was it, the, the well, FBI or? Well, it, um, it was the USPS um and I don't know if it was the FBI or not. It was like the inspector general of something or other, you know, is there like a department of the post office or something? I don't know. But um, it was whoever was the, like, you know, the, the investigative body responsible for things like that within the USPS. Yeah. So they were uh, interrogating him, asking him questions. And he was telling the guy, like, I'm going to be manipulating you and, yeah. and you know, this is how I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to say some things that are going to make you uncomfortable and I'm intentionally making you uncomfortable. And it's just this weird psychological like manipulation to try and manipulate him, yes. which, mm -hmm. which he came out and said, this is what I'm doing. And, yeah. and it's the exact same thing. I think that we're seeing with the media stuff is they're coming out and telling you they're doing this as further means of like unhinging you. And getting you to uh, not realize what's going on. Yeah. I'm not going to scare you, but I'm going to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know what that reminded me of? So uh, af right after the Robert Kennedy assassination, there was a witness who was interviewed oh. by a police officer. You saw the woman in the polka dot dress? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you remember that interview... He was telling her, "No, you you don't remember it that way. Yeah. That that isn't the way it happened. Your your memory is no, no. That's not the way it happened. Now you have to listen to me because you're not remembering things correctly." He wasn't asking her what she actually saw. He knew what she saw. He he was messing with her head. Anyway, so it, so it's the, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. And and it, this is the entertaining part of it is that it manifests in such absurd ways. Like anyone, we stayed up when we were watching the election coverage, like until three in the morning or something on election night. And I'm sure everyone, well, maybe not everyone, but I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of viewers would have seen live or read about it afterwards where there was a sudden jump, Pennsylvania or Michigan, I can't remember, for Biden, um, 138,000 votes you know, where Biden's numbers went up 138,000 and Trump's went up zero. And so, you know, watching it was like, okay, that's kind of, kind of strange. And so next morning, you know, reading what was, what had happened, there were a lot of tweets. Trump tweeted, what's going on here? A bunch of people were, were being like, there's something weird about this. Like that doesn't really happen. You never really, you, you, you could never get more than a hundred thousand votes that come in all for one candidate just it doesn't make any sense one candidate period not yeah. just like not trump <laughs> yeah uh but no no uh states uh representative no house representatives no senators no governors no nothing nothing well so in in this case well i'll give a bit of the background um i watched uh, i saw a clip from uh, some coverage by stephen crowder who was doing live coverage of the of the night and he had texted um, an acquaintance of his at the Washington Post. And so he, he said, look at this, 138,000 to votes to, to Biden. What, is, what does this mean? And uh, or this looks kind of fishy. And the, the Washington Post r reporter um, replied back, well, that was a, a, a Biden county, you know, nothing, nothing special to see here. Uh, it, it's to be expected. <laughs> Trump's tweet gets labeled as potential uh, election misinformation. And then that day, the day after the election, or well, the second day of the election, um, then all of a sudden that county comes forward saying, oh, that was a typo. You know, we sent in the wrong numbers. It was actually 13,000 votes for Biden, which in itself is kind of weird. Thirteen, Again, 13,000 votes only for Biden, but leaving that aside, we actually made a mistake. It was a typo. Now, think about that. They, ma they, they made an obvious error 
138,000 votes. And this Washington Post guy, nothing to see. Like, well, I don't, I don't see the problem. Right. You know what? That, that's to be expected. Mm-hmm. And tr- and labeling Trump's tweet, oh well, you know, potential vote uh, election inf- misinformation. That it was an acknowledged error. Mm-hmm. How? <laughs> So all of these people, all these potential misinformers out there, all of these like disbelievers actually turned out to be right. And Twitter's labeling their posts information, uh, misinformation, not just Trump's. Uh, Washington Post people are saying, oh, well, you know, what's, it looks totally normal to me. And it's this, again, coming back to our vision, it's this weird perceptual thing that goes on where um, data comes in in one way and just gets totally mangled and and uh um, transformed to 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 give this strange unreal output that doesn't bear any any relation to reality yeah well you know what that is harrison i think it's this ends justify the means philosophy uh that never trumpers i mean never it's all in the name never trumpers there's this imperative that exists in their minds and in their emotions that is quite willing to you know gloss over russiagate any but anything exactly anything that would allow them to say well wait a minute i might not like the guy i might not like that what he said about the you know this or that or the way he comports himself or the way he he did you know this policy or that policy but let me just give myself a little emotional distance from from this whole situation and call a spade a spade here. Let me let me give myself that. Let me let me allow myself to see this situation and all of its complexity and in and, and its nuances. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, I'll come to some understanding that will connect me to to something that's truer then my ends justify the means, uh, you know, imperative to be right or to defeat my enemy at all costs. And that, and that's one of the biggest problems I think that we're seeing right now. It's that it's, it's this, uh, it's really pathological. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a pathological, um, it's like a kind of a, a person it's become this personal personal mission statement to be right Mm -hmm. and to project everything that is negative about the world and about people onto this one political figure and it's 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 remarkable it's incredible and it's not just the um like trying to uh, i can't remember how you said it exactly but what what i was thinking was that it's not just you know, never Trump. It's, it's also, they have to dictate what reality will be. They have to control what people will experience. If 75% of Americans want Trump to, to be their president, who are you to tell those 75% of people? No, who are you? Like, how how do you know that that is what's best for those people? If that's what they want, then that's what they want. Mm -hmm. But you can't let them have that because you want to control because you think you know better because you're right Mm -hmm. and and they just can't allow it and it's the same thing that that um that goes along with uh like masks there's no choice there's mandates you have to you have no ability to choose whether or not uh it's good for you because it's a it's a blanket mandate everyone has to wear it well, what if you have other complicating factors and issues? Like, what if you have anxiety attacks every time you put on a mask? Well, you have to do it anyway because somebody who thinks they know better than you tells you you have to. And and that's just so, like, I, I don't even know how to describe it other than just like, <laughs> how dare you? You know, this gets back to global warming and, and, and Greta. This gets back to... Uh, all of the kinds of, you know, you have to kneel before BLM. Kneel before Zod. <laughs> the, these are all, I mean, you're right. It, it's, a, it's, it's not only you're wrong for having a, a different point of view, but how dare you and kneel before Zod. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's incredible. And 
you know, not to belabor the point, but I don't think it can be belabored. I don't, th- I don't think we can say this enough here. Uh, the, these are, these, this mindset, uh, this level of irrationality that isn't being questioned is exactly what they're accusing others of being Mm -hmm. fascists, totalitarians. Uh, their behavior is the very definition of, of fascism and totalitarianism. And it runs across a very broad spectrum of agendas. It's incredible, you know. Uh, yeah, like all <laughs> eight, still wow all eighteen the whole thing. agendas of the <laughs> of the you know uh, great uh, what is it the, the, the great, great monolithic conspiracy? <laughs> what is it the ruthless and monolithic conspiracy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the that whole thing. It's it's amazing to me how this the the COVID tyranny just checks all of the boxes for all of the agendas that we've been seeing tried to get pushed through from the globalist elite that's just all just like well covid's great for this and covid's great for that like you can't, it's a panacea for all of their problems mm-hmm. that they've been trying to push and people have said no for this that and the other reason it's like oh we've got a perfect way to just shove it down their throats yeah mm-hmm. well maybe to to kind of tie everything together um all of these examples i think We've discussed we've discussed some of the like psychological things behind these attitudes and and uh, just phenomena and why they happen and they all kind of share the they share a one feature at least one feature um, and that is this inability to accept well inability an an inability to accept an uncomfortable truth which is basically in other words a fact an uncomfortable fact. So when a fact is presented to um, any given mind, you know, that, that makes it uncomfortable, it will then just be automatically rejected. So we see this in the, in the, the Jesus mythicists and the, and the, the Muhammad um, not historicists, and we see it in Republicans and Democrats and anyone, anyone with, a, with a large, you know, anyone within a large um, social grouping of some sort like that. You see this mind, bl- uh, I won't call it mind blindness because that means something else, but this, you know, this, this selective blindness to certain facts. So when you point out, for example, to a, um, um, a never Trumper, um, any, just any kind of contradictory fact that goes against their worldview, it just, it, they, there's no acknowledgement of it whatsoever. Um, and even just an oddity or an inconsistency or a, or a hypocrisy, it's like there's absolutely cannot see it when you point out okay well like uh, the the there's some really like cheap ones like the you know kids in cages it's like oh well obama did that doesn't matter um you know oh well um obama started all these wars oh well wars actually wars are good now um now that i think about it um obama's the reason for slavery in libya again yeah. it's like oh but you know these things just don't compute and so they they don't actually enter into the the mind space, the the actual mind space of these individuals. But I'll take that back. I think they do enter the mind space, and that's why we see what we see. And that gets back to your point that you made earlier, um, Adam, about why we see this kind of like degeneration in a guy like Keith Olbermann is that there's something that's not computing, right? He's he's operating in a he's operating a, a certain type of software um, in a, in, a, in an environment in which that software doesn't apply. He's running the wrong program, essentially, um, for the, the reality he's living in. And I'll just read one sentence from Ponerology on the same page as the one I read previously, um, in a totally different context, but I'll just read this one sentence. He says, um, after all, invariably, when we analyze negative psychological attitudes, we always discern an affirmation which has been repressed from the field of consciousness. As a consequence, the constant The constant subconscious effort of denying concepts about existing things engenders a zeal to eliminate them in other people. Mm. The constant subconscious effort of denying concepts about existing things engenders a zeal to eliminate them in other people. Like the one application of that would be the more you deny certain realities about yourself, about um, the, the facts that go into your worldview, the more you will project that onto others and try to eliminate them in other people. So that's that's why we see in any revolutionary movement, you see um, that that's why we see the revolutionaries 
behaving in ways that are as bad or worse than the people that they are revolting against. That's why Antifa is an anti Antifa is a fascist movement because by they're essentially projecting their own fascist tendencies onto others and then wanting to eliminate those tendencies in those other people without the acknowledgement that actually those are their own tendencies. And it could, those tendencies do exist in other people. Like those tendencies are exist in all groups, in all people, like no matter what country you live, no matter what segment of the, of geography or demographic, you'll always find evil people in them. Um, but the people most vociferous about eliminating that in other people tend to be those precise types of people. So you have, um, if you look at any communist revolution, they're fighting against fascism or against uh, imperialism or against some monarchy, and they end up being just like totally bloodthirsty bastards. If you look at any right-wing revolution or right-wing uprising, it's like, the uh, again, we're fighting those evil commies, they're going to like, you know, they're going to kill as many of them as possible and brutalize them. And uh, that's just the way things work. And so... Um, I guess, yeah, I guess we'll just have to close it there. Um, <laughs> well, we can also say the, you know, to avoid all of this stuff, don't become identified with yeah. any one particular ideology or uh, one particular idea, but yeah. build yourself up on truth. Exactly. Start with focus, focus on truth above all else mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, let, <laughs> let it lead you, you know, wherever it will. Because if you do that, you'll be able to see the errors in other people, and you'll be able to see the errors in yourself and in your in your own self-identified in-group. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the the best way to make like the way to make the Democrats great again would be to engage in some hard like self-criticism and, and criticism and saying these are the things we've been doing wrong. These are the aspects about ourselves that we really don't like and that we could really improve on. I mean, same thing, of course, Republicans can always do that too. Everyone should always be doing that. But this the tendency not to do so and to be so like ridiculously absurdly entrenched in one's own worldview where you can't where you where you are totally blind to contradictory facts that that go against that worldview um which is like on full display in um, well, it's, it's on full display today. I'll just say that like it's undeniable. And if you can't see it, there's something genuinely wrong with your brain. Um, probably for many of the reasons that we've been talking about. Um, like if, if you can't do that, that should be the sign that you should start doing it. Um, because things will only get worse. You might, and like Lobachevsky said, uh, it can lead to a neurotic condition. You might turn into Keith Olbermann. You might turn into, um, um, like Dick Cheney. I mean, you wouldn't want to be either of those guys. And, um, yeah, and, maybe just leave it. And I would just add that, you know, developing the capacity to, to question difficult things or beliefs that one has, I think, enables one to, you know, you've developed the, the, the muscles, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the will, the, the understanding of, of what's involved within yourself. And, um, not that it ever becomes <clears throat> necessarily easy, but I think it becomes easier if you nurture that drive for, as you were saying, Adam, finding out what the, what the truth of the matter is. Yeah. All right. So we'll end it there. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And uh, stay safe and don't become part of the Borg. <laughs> <laughs>